Hey, good morning. Morning once again. And we're going to talk about uh, the satisfied life, uh, what we have, what we need, what we want, and uh, who we are. May our gracious God be pleased to meet us in this time and to minister and direct our lives. I want to begin by showing you uh, an old family picture. Uh, in this uh, picture that you should see, it has my uh, grandparents, uh, Ernie and Crystal Marietta, my mom and my uncle, circa 1957. Now, my grandfather, Ernie, uh, Ernie was born in 1907 and he died in 1997. Died on his birthday, 90 years old to the day. And he was raised in uh, Southern Illinois, poverty, poverty situation that I cannot possibly imagine. Went to grade school for a few years. And the family legend said that during the Depression, when he could not find work in the Midwest, he climbed on on a boxcar and rode the boxcar to Colorado when he thought he could find a farming job in Colorado. Now, uh, I took my children out to the uh, eastern plains of Wyoming to visit my grandparents when they were really little. This was probably uh, when my grandfather was about 85 years old. And so we're visiting them out on the prairie, and my grandfather was bound and determined to take us to dinner at an all-you-can-eat buffet that was about 30 miles away. And so we piled into our van, Grandma and Grandpa, my wife, Chris, and uh, my three kids, and we're driving. And on the way, he begins to describe this all-you-can-eat buffet to me. And so he said, now, now, Jeffy, there's chicken at this buffet. And your boys, they can go up and get a piece of chicken. And if they want more, they can go back up. They can eat as much as they please. He said, all right. Traveled another 10 miles down the road, heading toward the all-you-can-eat buffet. And he said, now, they have pie at this buffet. And your boys can go up and they can get themselves a piece of pie. And if they're hungry for another piece of pie, they can go back for a second piece of pie. They can eat as much as they please. Okay. And we arrive at the buffet, and we walk inside, and we're seated at a table. And my dear loving grandfather says, now, they can get a plate, and they can go up, and they can pick out whatever they please. And at this time, I'm going like, Grandpa, Thanks for breaking it down for me, but I think I understand the concept of a buffet. And of course, it wasn't me that was having difficulty fathoming taking young children to an all-you-can-eat buffet. To my grandfather, raised in extreme poverty, the opulence of a child being able to go up and get a piece of pie, and being able to get a second piece of pie, and if they wanted to, getting a third piece of pie, was so alien from his experience that he was absolutely thrilled to offer these riches to his great-grandchildren. <laughs> and of course, the wonder of being at an all-you-can-eat buffet where you can have two pieces of dessert was totally lost on me and absolutely lost on my kids. Because though my grandfather had been raised in extreme poverty, I was not and my children were not. And it was just one of those many times driving away from that experience and realizing the problem is not simply that I'm rich. That problem is that I'm rich and I forget that I'm rich. <laughs> the, the problem isn't just simply that I'm affluent by world standards where people awaken in the morning and gather sticks to build a fire for warmth or food or walk miles to fill jugs with water to walk back to their homes. The, the problem isn't simply that I'm affluent on world standards or even compared to generations gone by in this country. The problem is that I'm affluent and don't feel affluent. I'm affluent and I feel, I feel normal. And so increasingly, I, I am, I'm asking this question, you know, what does it mean to have the heart and the brain of Jesus, the heart and mind of Christ, in dealing with my wealth, in dealing with my stuff? What, what does it mean to think Christianly about what I have, what I need, what I want, and who I am? 
And I think a, a good starting point is to look at a passage of Scripture. This is found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Just absorb this as I, as I read this to you. Uh, the words uh, follow. It says, uh, command those who are rich in this present world, that's me at the all-you-can-eat buffet, command them and not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our what? For our enjoyment. For our enjoyment. Think of that. Now, I've got a question. Who's writing? Who are they writing to? Where are they? And what's going on there? Is 1 Timothy chapter 6, we believe the author is the Apostle Paul, an older pastor writing to his protege, Timothy, the younger pastor. If you open the pages of a study Bible, uh, background to 1 Timothy, you would, you would read that we suspect that Timothy is pastoring in the city of Ephesus. And so, the younger pastor is pastoring in Ephesus, and Paul writes to him and says, now, Timothy, the wealthy in your congregation are going to need some specialized discipleship. They're going to need some specialized training and how to deal with their money, how to deal with their affluence. So these are the unique instructions you're supposed to give them. But before we break down this verse a little bit, not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth because it's so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who gives us things to enjoy. Before we look at the verses, let's spend a second looking at the context. Uh, there's a map here which shows uh, the city of Ephesus on uh, the Aegean coastline. This would be a modern-day Turkey. You see the, the boot of Italy off to the left on the satellite imagery. So you have Italy to the left, Greece in the middle, and then uh, Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey. Now, Ephesus in the first century was the fourth largest city in the Roman world. We think it was surpassed only in population by Rome, uh, Alexandria, Egypt, and a city called Antioch in the region of Syria. Ephesus dominated trade along that side of the Aegean Sea. It was the primary import and export center. If you lived in Ephesus, it, in today's currency, it would be like living in, in New York City or in, in Hong Kong. Now, I've had the privilege of traveling and filming in Ephesus a few times for various uh, filming projects. One was just uh, six weeks ago. Let me just show you two different locations in Ephesus which kind of bring its wealth into focus as a city and as a trade center. And the first little video clip here is uh, just a video clip of the Agora or the, the marketplace. Uh, we have passed through the triple uh, ornamental archway into the marketplace. We took this footage from up above. From left to right, it encompasses those trees to the right. It was 100 yards by 100 yards, the size of two football fields side by side. Two football fields side by side around the Agora Ring, though it's called a stoa, a covered walkway. This provided shoppers with uh, shade in the burning Mediterranean heat. And also, if you're there in the winter months, it kept you, know, you out of the rain. And so there's an open courtyard in the middle, stoa around the outside. And then it's ringed with shops, about 100 shops ring the marketplace of Ephesus. You know what you could buy in that space? Anything in the world. Because of the ships that were coming and going, because of the trade routes overland, you could buy spices from the Far East, you could buy jewelry from Egypt, you could buy the latest fashions from Rome, you could buy beautiful purple cloth uh, dyed in Thyatira, you could find anything in that space. Now, when Paul writes to Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world, they're living in that culture. So that's, I just wanted to take you on a trip to the, to the Agora, to the marketplace. But the next place is even more stunning. They're called the, the terrace houses. And so just watch this, uh, watch this brief video with me of the terrace houses. This was the high rent district of Ephesus. Notice that the floors are paved with mosaics, tens of thousands of tiny stones put together in geometric, I wouldn't even want to have to do the geometry on these to, to, to lay them out. Uh, different figures on the floors. Uh, the, the walls, the walls were brick, but then plastered, and then the walls are painted. Uh, you know, art majors, you call it, you know, frescoes. And so the frescoes were of uh, Greek philosophers, uh, different actors and actresses from the day, also household, uh, common, uh, everyday scenes from life. Uh, pipes carrying hot air from your bathhouse. So they had, they had central heating. Uh, restrooms that took sewage out to the main street. 
the terrace houses that are now covered with a roof system in order to protect uh, the uh, excavated ruins from the, the, the elements. Walking through the terrace houses, you get a sense these people spared no expense in their, in their floors, in their plumbing, in the layout of the house, in the beautiful artwork on the walls. And they're centrally located. I mean, the Agora, the marketplace, is yards away, the library, the theaters right down the street, the bath complex. Again, in today's currency, if you were in downtown Chicago, this would be like living you know, right off the, the Magnificent Mile. If you're in New York City, this is like living right across from Central Park. Now, let's assume, or let's imagine, that some of the individuals living in the terrace houses became followers of the Christ. That is, the, 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 the church in Ephesus, let's imagine it's a wide uh, economic spectrum. There are those that came from the poverty class, but also those that came with incredible affluence. Now, here's the challenge for Timothy as he's pastoring this congregation. Timothy, for people that have the ability to walk through the agora, and buy item after item after item, people have lots of financial margin. For those people in your congregation who become part of the Jesus movement and they're living up on the hill, <laughs> what specialized training are they going to need? What, what unique discipleship are they going to need so that the very blessings that may be intended to pull them toward God don't cause them to drift from God? How can the financial blessings we have pull us toward the heart of the Creator rather than push us from the heart of the Creator? And so in the first letter to Timothy, chapter 6, Paul says, you just need to address the affluent in your congregation, and they need special coaching. So people living in the terrace houses, people able to shop freely with financial margin in the marketplace, what did they need to hear? And Paul says, well, command those who are rich in this present world. He said, command them not to be, I don't know how many of you remember the word, not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, read Housing Collapse of 2008, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our, and what was that word? What was that word? Everything for our, what was that? Enjoyment. Now, let's focus on that first. Does that surprise you that that's there? That, that, that one of the words from our gracious God to people with financial ability is this. Enjoy this. Enjoy this. Enjoy the bread that you eat. Enjoy the olive oil that you dip it into. Enjoy the ability to wear clothes that, that, that fit, that you like. Enjoy, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Does it surprise you that that's there? That the creator just whispers, if you've got some financial capacity and it comes with the ability to buy food and clothing and a home that you enjoy, two words, enjoy this. Now, let me do something for a second. Let me, let me depart from, uh, from Paul's words to Timothy in Ephesus. And let me, let me drop back to the uh, Old Testament, to the Psalms. We're reading song lyrics here. Listen to these words from Psalm 104. It's about the creator and what he makes for our benefit. It says, uh, he waters, uh, Psalm 104, verse 13, he waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle, plants for men to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens the heart of man, oil that makes his face shine, and bread that sustains his heart. What you have in Psalm 104 is a poem, is a song to the goodness of God for what he has made for the things that we enjoy. Rain falls, grass grow, cattle graze, uh, vineyards fill with uh, clusters of grapes, uh, olive trees produce uh, olives which are ground into, you know, olive oil for dipping your bread into, oil that makes a face shine, bread that satisfies his heart, wine that gladdens coming from the rain of our gracious God. Listen to the lyrics of Psalm 104. The very blessings we receive from the earth should cause us to move toward the Creator. As he whispers, enjoy this and know me. 
what if in the crops that grow and the vegetables that grow and the fruit that grows, what if our Creator is saying, enjoy this and move toward me in thanksgiving and gratitude? Enjoy this, enjoy this, enjoy this. Let me ask you a question. What do you enjoy? I enjoy rich, dark coffee in the morning with way too much half and half cream. I enjoy fires in my backyard in a fire pit in summer months and into the cold fall. I enjoy riding my bike along the lake shore. What is it that you enjoy? What if your creator whispers, enjoy this, enjoy this, enjoy this, but don't put your hope in it and don't become arrogant about it. That's the verse. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, it comes and goes, but to put their hope in God, who gives us things to enjoy. So, a, a word about arrogance. What's that, what's that doing there? It, you know, I've got, a, I've got a suspicion that as wealth grows, so can grow the idea, I did this. I did this, and it's all about me. There's something about financial opportunity that as someone goes through a series of uh, career transitions that are in the upward direction, as raises accumulate, that there's this possibility to go, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. And the reason it feels like that is because we did do some of it, and maybe a lot of it. We had to set an alarm clock. We had to get up in the morning. We had to work hard. We had to earn a degree. We had to fill out an application. We had to get hired by an organization. We had to be diligent within that organization. And so there's the ability as prosperity to come to feel like, like we have achieved this. And, and yet I think, I think to look at this Christianly is to say, there are certain advantages I have come into through hard work but there are other advantages that I have been given that I did not work for. <laughs> I was born in America in 1962. I worked diligently. I worked hard. <laughs> but if I had been born in China in 1962, or Cambodia in 1972, or the lowest caste in India in any generation, my opportunities may have been radically different. In addition to that, I had parents that worked hard, that were very diligent, and so I was raised in a, in a household where diligence was something that was, was honored. And so I'm a diligent person, I work hard, and yet I go, you know something? There are some things I can take credit for, and there are some things I simply cannot take credit for. There's that beautiful verse in the Old Testament as the Israelites are about to exit the wilderness and enter the land of promise, where it talks about God, for it is He who gives the ability to make wealth. And so if arrogance is the voice that says, I did this, I did this, I did this, and it's all about me, the question is, how do you keep that from happening if you are able to enjoy <laughs> an all-you-can-eat buffet without even realizing the opulence that surrounds us? That is, we live in a culture that's bombarded with advertising, that commercials on TV only take up the empty space between, you know, the, the programs only take up the empty space between the commercials. You open a magazine and you have to flip through glossy ad after glossy ad just to get to the first article. In an advertising materialistic culture that's saturated in debt, how can you keep your heart moving with our Lord's heart in relationship to what it means to be a people of affluence and a people of opportunity. And, and what Paul does here is he immediately moves to two behaviors, two different disciplines that can help guide our heart toward honoring God with our wealth instead of becoming arrogant jerks about our wealth. And so uh, verse 18 is the very next verse in this passage in 1 Timothy where he says, uh, command them, uh, those people living on the terrace houses, the people able to shop freely and with margin in the Agora. Timothy, uh, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. Now, there's four different items there, but they kind of separate kind of two and two. He says, first, uh, command them to, uh, to do good and to be rich in, to be rich in what? Good deeds. So, let's call this serving. 
to do good and be rich in good deeds. And then he said, uh, but there's something else too. Command them to be generous and, and what? Willing to share. And so, let's just bundle these two under the topic sharing. And so, what Paul seems to be writing to the pastor Timothy is, you need to coach your people to share and serve, to serve and share. And these disciplines may help train the heart away from arrogance and toward appropriate view of our wealth. Command them to do good and to be rich in good deeds. Command them to do good. What's that doing there? So, Paul, I thought you were talking about money, and all of a sudden you're talking about doing good and being good deed, being a good deeder, you know? What does that have to do with money? Think about it this way. Um, if there's something about accumulated wealth that goes, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me. My friends, there is something about humble servanthood that goes, it's not about me. It's not about me. Through giving your life away in service, it can begin to train the channels of the heart in an anti-arrogance path as we serve humbly and faithfully and consistency uh, with consistency, not simple acts of servant, but a lifetime of servanthood. Over and over again, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. So if an affluent man in my congregation held a private coffee with me and said, hey, dude, we got to talk. I feel like money is getting a hold of my life. I feel like greed is growing. What do I do? I say, serve in the church nursery. He goes, no, no, you don't understand. This is a money problem. I go, I know. You know the aunt that when you visit in the nursing home, all she does is talk about how nobody ever visits? Visit her twice a month. No, no, no. This is a money problem. Yeah, I know. You know the cantankerous widow that lives down the street whose grass is way too high? Mow her lawn in addition to yours. Paul is saying here, to do good and to be rich in good deeds you go, what does that have to do with money? I believe it trains the channels of the heart to go over and over again. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. I think a lifetime of serving helps us think better about our wealth. I believe that serving is an anti-ego experience when done out of a pure and humble heart. If you find yourself thriving financially, if you are interested in having a heart that is alive to God, that doesn't numb out to God, if you desire to have a humble heart and not one that grows in arrogance and self-importance and self-centeredness and self-focus, I submit to you that one discipline is the discipline of serving over and over and over and over a lifetime of goodness. There's something I think that cripples this concept of serving for my younger friends. Paul says, do good and be rich in good deeds. You know what can cripple this? A lot of my younger friends, my children's friends, they don't want to do something good. They want to do something great. They want to change the world. And they're waiting for these moments when their unique contribution to humanity will be discovered. These moments where they will be able to step in and do something profoundly great, and as they're waiting for something great, an opportunity for something great to appear, hundreds of opportunities to do something simply and humbly good go passing them by in a parade. Often we refuse to devote our lives to doing something that's humbly good because we're waiting to do something great. And I've just begun to ask the question, What if the great life, what if you achieve greatness in life, not through doing great things, but doing good things over and over and over and over and over again? What if you arrive at greatness, not through doing great things? What if you arrive at greatness by doing good things, humbly and repetitively? What if greatness is goodness compounded? Jesus' disciples argued about greatness, and there was a time where our Lord took them aside, and he said, I don't argue with your desire to be great. I'll just challenge you with the path to greatness. He said, whoever wants to be great must become the the servant of all. Humbly serve. Paul says, Timothy, you got people with a lot of financial means in your congregation. They need special coaching. They really need special coaching. Someone from the terrace houses becomes part of the Jesus community, Teach them to serve, man. Teach them to serve because it is through serving that they will begin to train the channels of the heart to understand it's not all about me. It's not all about me. It's not all about me. 
Paul's other thing was about sharing. He says, command them to... Um, uh, command them to be good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share the second half of that verse. Generous and willing to share. Uh, have you yet committed yourself to a lifetime of faithful systematic giving? Y you know the most dangerous word when it comes to giving, when it comes to pursuing the life of generosity? I don't think the most dangerous word is the word no. Because when you sense God call upon your life to give generously, and I don't just mean someday when you're in career world, I mean, I mean now. See, if you say no, at least if you cross your arms and say, no, I'm not going to do it, at least now you and God can have a good argument about it. The most lethal word, I think, is the word later. Because we mean it. We go, I desire to be a generous person that lives on a portion of my income and sets aside a systematic portion of my income to give away, and I mean it later. Right now, are you kidding me as a college student? You're kidding me, right? And then you graduate, and then you go, yeah, 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 but now I'm in the job search and the job hunt and just getting grounded. Maybe we're saving for the down payment on a home. Maybe we're newlywed, then maybe a baby comes, and now maybe we're trying to move from one home to another. I mean, we deeply desire to be people of generosity, but now, are you kidding me? We want to be these people, but later, and we mean it. And then our children grow, and now they're ready to move into college. And maybe at the same time, we have parents with significant financial needs, and we find ourselves trying to help our kids and our parents at the same time. And all of a sudden, we turn around, and we're 50. And we discover that there was never a good time to give significant chunks of our income away. My challenge to those of you who are 18, 19, 20, and 21, start somewhere, start now. Pick a percentage, pick a segment of whatever you receive in income or checks from your uncle, and set that money aside as sacred to the Lord to spend on something other than you. Sponsoring someone through Compassion International or world vision, you helping a friend going on a mission trip, the local church that you attend week after week after week, something comes out of your pocket and goes into the basket on a systematic, faithful way. My friends, there's never, if you're waiting for a good time to give money away, you may find yourself waiting and waiting and waiting. So for people of abundance and people with margin, what does it mean to adopt the heart and mind of Christ? And Paul says, well, just, we need some coaching here. Share, serve and share, share and serve. When Chris and I got married, we were 21 years old. We had one year of college to go. We packed our belongings in Northern California where the wedding was. And as we traveled back to Michigan to finish school, we had nothing. I mean, we had this, you know, older car, barely reliable. The trunk, our earthly belongings fit in the trunk, you know, the new blender, the popcorn popper, the six cheese globes that apparently were popular wedding gifts at the time, you know, in the early 80s. And so we move into our upstairs apartment, one bedroom apartment, and we begin our minimum wage jobs as we finish school, and we had nothing. Can I rewind the tape and can we look at that scenario again? We drove across the country in our car. Google it later, roughly between 8% of the world and 10% of the world has automobile ownership. We were in the world's top 10% as newlyweds, even though the reliability of this vehicle was a little sketchy, the sucker drove. And we were returning to Michigan in order to finish college. We were literate and college, soon to be college educated. And uh, we were able to move into a one-bedroom apartment, but at age 21, we were able to live independently of our parents. And those new appliances we had, the, the, the blender, the popcorn popper, we were able to plug into outlets with consistent electricity. My, my, my point here is not that we're rich now, fully entrenched as middle-aged, middle-class Americans. I realized that we were rich then when I look back and say, we had nothing. 
So I ask, how am I supposed to deal with that? What am I supposed to do with that? And I think my Lord would whisper, Jeff, enjoy this. But let your enjoyment of it pull you toward me and not push you away. And Jeff, devote yourself to serving people. And devote yourself to consistent generosity. Because as you pursue these twin disciplines, you can learn to adopt the heart and mind of Christ in coming to grips with the wealth you swim in. May God give you wise and discerning hearts. May there be something from his word here today that captures you, that seizes you, and that sticks with you. As you grow, and as you learn, and as you age, may you serve the Christ fully and deeply with what you have been given. Amen. We'll see you tomorrow.